I agree with Pastor Jeff that we say often that the, that the very heart of the gospel is generosity. And as believers in Christ, we believe that generosity is an expression, an experience of God's grace itself. And that's what we're going to talk about here some this morning. I would guess that most of you here know at least the basic outline of the great worldwide phenomenon that is Coca-Cola. You know that Coke was invented in 1886 uh, by a man named John Pemberton who lived in Atlanta. What I didn't know until I read about it this week was that John Pemberton was a Civil War veteran who had been wounded in the war and actually was trying to create a pain reliever with his miracle elixir and sort of accidentally created the best-selling soft drink of all time. The first year Coke was in existence, he sold an average of nine servings a day for a grand total profit margin of $50 that first year. Today, Coke boasts daily sales of 1.9 billion servings. That's every day. And their revenues this year are somewhere upwards of $42 billion. Coca-Cola is the quintessential American success story. In fact, I would say that other than the gospel, Coca-Cola might be the most remarkable evangelistic story in the history of the world. <laughs> Here's why. I've had a chance to travel, maybe more than some, not as much as others, but everywhere I've been on five continents, whether it's been Cochabamba, Bolivia, Moscow, Russia, Istanbul, Turkey, San Pedro de Macorís, Dominican Republic, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, or Oshkosh, Wisconsin, I've always been able to find a cold Coke in every one of those places, usually within 10 minutes if I try. Think about the reach, and it's just a soft drink. It's amazing. Uh, and for almost a decade, or excuse me, a century, Coca-Cola dominated the soft drink market, completely dominated with iconic marketing slogans like the real thing. Remember that one? But in about 1970, that started to change. By then, more other soft drinks started to enter the market, and the biggest challenger, of course, was Pepsi. And in 1975, Pepsi launched a famous ad campaign called the Pepsi Challenge. Some of you remember this, right? For others of you who are, okay, younger, this is like me talking about the Roman Empire, right? 1975. <laughs> but they launched this ad campaign called the Pepsi Challenge, and they sat real people down at the table with two little white unmarked cups with soft drink. One had Pepsi, one had Coke. They didn't tell them which was which. And they just said, taste them, tell us which one you prefer. And they put these on ad campaigns live. And over and over again, people would choose the slightly sweeter taste of Pepsi. And that created great concern in Coke executives. They got worried that maybe Pepsi was, was going to creep into their market share. And Pepsi was creeping up in the market share, a little bit by a little bit, a percent every year. And so they conducted their own secret taste challenges. This is Coke now. They did their own secret challenges to see if it was true or not. And they found the same thing. People in their own challenge chose Pepsi over Coke. And then the Coke executives panicked. They made a decision to change the century-old secret formula of the real thing. Made it slightly sweeter, and in 1985, they launched a massive ad campaign and launched what they called New Coke. Some of you remember that. You remember what the re response was? Overwhelmingly disastrous. The Coke drinking public was outraged. The company was deluged with letters and phone calls from angry customers. Coke actually hired a psychiatrist to review the complaints to, so they would understand them. And the psychiatrist told them people are responding as if they lost a family member. <laughs> right? You guys really blew it. And within two months, Coke was forced to reintroduce the original formula, the real thing, and they called it Coke Classic. Now hold that story in your mind. We're going to get to it a little bit later. But we're in a series now called Uncomfortable Grace. Jeff introduced this, the whole series a few weeks ago by saying, grace is that which we barely understand but desperately need. And we've learned so far that grace is uncomfortable because we have to admit that we need it in order to experience it. And it's also uncomfortable because to offer it to someone else, we have to get close to them, which means getting close to broken and hurting people. Today we're going to look at grace as the central, unchanging, irreplaceable truth of the gospel, the real thing, and that there's no substitute for grace. We're going to be in the New Testament book called Colossians. Most of you know that Colossians is actually a letter written from the Apostle Paul to a group of believers, young Christians, in an ancient city called Colossae. Now take a look at this map. <laughs> 
shows you where Colossae is. It's uh, located in southwest, what we would call Turkey today, then called Galatia or Asia Minor, about 100 miles east of the port city, Ephesus, to which he wrote the letter called Ephesians. Now, Colossae at that time was known as the, one of the world's greatest producers of fine wool, so it was a commercial center. It's interesting that a few years after Paul wrote this letter, the Roman Empire built a great highway that bypassed Colossae and turned it into a ghost town within a few years. So the ruins, there's not much ruins that even left there today. But at the time, it was an important city, and there was a church there started by a young man named Epaphras. Now, Epaphras had become a follower of Jesus under the teaching and influence of the Apostle Paul in Ephesus, and then he'd gone out as sort of a missionary and started this young new church in Colossae. So he was a mentor E of the Apostle Paul. And scholars believe that this letter Paul's writing is in response to a letter long since lost that Epaphras wrote to Paul saying, I have a problem. I don't know how to deal with it. My people are getting confused by some other teachers. Can you help me out? And Paul writes this letter in response. So let's read and see what Paul says. Colossians chapter 1. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in, G in Christ Jesus and of your love you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Now, the first thing I want to point out here is Paul is reminding them and us of what he calls the true gospel. The true gospel. When I was in high school, I've told you before, I, uh, we lived about 40 miles north of New York City. And when I was in middle school and high school, I would go to bed almost every night listening to my little transistor radio. It was pre-tablets, pre-smartphones, all that stuff. So I had a little transistor radio. Uh, and I would put it under my pillow and listen to ball games at night when I was supposed to be sleeping. Uh, so my parents couldn't hear me listening to the radio. And I'm, <coughs> excuse me, I listened to Yankee games and Nick games and so forth. But every now and then when there wasn't a game on the air, I would by chance hear uh, a, a preacher named Reverend Ike. Anybody ever heard of Reverend Ike? Now it's not Dwight Eisenhower. This was a man named Frederick J. Eicherencoder, Reverend Ike for short. And he had a ministry in New York City called the United Church Science of Living Institute. Too bad we didn't see that name when we were thinking about changing our name. <laughs> and even though I only heard snippets of his preaching, I did know enough to know, even at age 16, 17, that his sermons were different than what I was used to hearing. He would say things like, you like my $500 suit? You like my $200 shoes? You like my brand new Rolls Royce? You should, because you paid for them. He would just say that to his listeners. Uh, and he, his, his show, his broadcasts were on 1,700 different radio stations around the country. 2.5 million people listened to him every week. So he preached a version of what today is called the prosperity gospel. That the root of all evil is not the love of money, but the lack of money. He actually taught his followers to pray this prayer. Money, I'm calling you into my life. I know you hear me right here, right now. I'm telling you, money, you love me. He said things like, the ultimate truth that brings money to you is the realization that I am money. Money is God in action, he would say. Now, you don't have to be much of a theologian to recognize that he's preaching a different kind of gospel. Well, that's what was happening, evidently, in ancient Colossae. That's why Paul writes, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you've already heard in the true message of the gospel. I put that in red so you'd notice it. That has come to you. Now when Paul says the true message of the gospel, we can assume that he's inferring that there are other gospel messages out there. And that's true. Evidently Epaphras had become concerned about some persuasive spiritual teachers that were growing in popularity. And they were teaching a kind of blend of Jewish legalism, uh, Greek philosophy, pagan mysticism, all couched in Christian language, and people were getting confused. So he asked for Paul's help. For example, they were teaching a version of 
Gnostic philosophy, which taught basically that the spiritual world, the unseen world was good, but the material world, the physical world, was evil. And that's significant because that told them that Jesus could not have been God. Because Jesus had a physical body, therefore he couldn't have been God because all matter is evil. And that confused them. Because if Jesus wasn't God in the flesh, the whole gospel falls apart. They also taught a version of, of Jewish legalism and pagan mysticism, that faith in Christ was not enough for eternal salvation. You also had to follow certain religious rules. You had to follow certain religious food laws. You had to practice certain new moon rituals. They taught that since human beings were physical and were evil, they could not have direct contact with God himself. They couldn't pray directly to God. You couldn't worship directly to God. You had to pray through a series of hierarchy, hierarchical angels and spirit beings. All of it was very confusing. Now the word gospel, in its classic sense, to us as Christians, means good news. It means the announcement that God has already accomplished something through Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news that God has already given us the certain hope of heaven through faith in Jesus Christ. And anything else, whether it be religious legalism, magical incantations, the worship of angels, Reverend Ike's prosperity gospel, anything else is not gospel at all, but is rather counterfeit gospel. Now what are the counterfeit gospels in our world today? Well, there is the prosperity gospel. There are still people preaching versions of that. You'll see them on TV from time to time. But more than that, there are some very subtle sort of cultural assumptions that are in the air we live in today. Let me try to summarize them for you. For example, there's what I would call the identity gospel. That the secret of happiness and fulfillment is to be the self you most want to be. And you, can get, you get to determine the identity of your own true self. The identity gospel. There is what I would call the truth gospel. That is, the only one capable of giving you, you, telling you what's true for you is you. We now live in a culture that no longer believes that truth is discovered, that truth is eternal and discovered, rather that the individual can create truth. There's the truth gospel. There's what I would call the science and technology gospel. That the true hope for the world is through science and technology. That actually religion is a backward way of thinking that it's the enemy of progress. And there's what I would maybe call the human evolution gospel. That history is progressing. That human civilization is evolving continuously to a more compassionate and just way of living. So that we just have to put our faith in humanity. To evolve. I would actually argue that the exact opposite is happening. That technology changes over the centuries, but human beings don't change and haven't changed. But we live in a culture today that says gospel, good news, happiness and fulfillment, joy, salvation is finding your true self, creating your own truth and being true to that, and hoping that science and technology will save the world one day. That's the culture we live in, and Paul begs to differ. He says, all that's counterfeit. There is a true gospel. And there is only one true gospel, and that's Christ. Now, secondly, he begins to talk about, actually, let me back up a bit. He says, that's Christ. And then he tells us what that gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, just in another book he wrote to those people. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. It's important that I read that to you and didn't skip over it because Paul says that the true gospel is a man, a real man who lived in time and space, crucified, dead, and risen again. Why does he say that? Because the true gospel says the problem with the world is not politics, is not global warming, is not racism, is not education. The problem with the world is what the Bible calls sin. All that other stuff are just symptoms. All those other things are just symptoms of a deeper problem. The problem with my life and my relationships when I have them is my own struggle with sin. The problem with your life is not the government, it's not your family, it's not your university. The problem with your life is also sin. And the true gospel says that the solution to the problem of sin is the God who came in the flesh, who took on himself the sins of the world, who destroyed the power of sin and death once and for all, who will one day redeem all the created order, 
into how he first designed it. And he makes that salvation available to all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, how is that uncomfortable grace? Our whole series this summer is uncomfortable grace. Well, first of all, it's uncomfortable because it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy to our culture. A pastor named Matt Chandler has written a book called Explicit Gospel. In that book, he says, we are never, ever, ever going to make Christianity so cool that everybody wants it. We're never, ever, ever going to make the gospel so cool that everybody wants it. And that's true. It's always going to sound crazy to somebody. Secondly, it's uncomfortable because it's a claim of truth. And whenever you claim one thing is true, you're saying other things are not true. So it's uncomfortable for us to say that we are dead without Christ in our lives. We're dead. It's uncomfortable to say that you have no hope for salvation, for eternal life, without Christ. It's uncomfortable to say that there is no other gospel besides Christ Jesus, crucified, dead, buried, and risen again to a culture that wants to believe almost anything else. See, Paul here is driving a stake in the ground. He's driving a stake in the ground to remind these young believers in Colossae, to remind this young pastor named Epaphras, And to remind us that none of these other philosophies, religious ideas, or cultural narratives, no matter how intelligent they sound, no matter how smart they are, no matter how relevant they seem, none of them are gospel. There is only one gospel, and that's Christ. That's the true gospel. Secondly, Paul points us to the growing gospel. The growing gospel. A few years ago, um, a powerful storm ripped through uh, Kane County. It just seemed like a normal thunderstorm, but then there was a burst of wind uh, right in our neighborhood that I, so powerful that it actually snapped a tree in our yard right in half, about an eight-inch diameter tree. It was uh, incredible. It snapped the top of it off and blew it right into our driveway like 20 yards away. So we had to have that tree replaced. So we hired a, a nursery, came out, dug out the stump, put a new tree in, much smaller, but it would grow and replace that tree. Well, at first, that tree grew, fi- grew fine. But by the second year or so, we noticed that one, in one part of the tree that the leaves looked a little little anemic. They were there, but they were kind of anemic. By the next year, there were no leaves on a couple of those branches on that side of the tree. All the way to today, maybe six years later, a full one-third of that tree looks as if it might be dead. In fact, I pulled this branch off just yesterday, that tree. (laughs) And I'm not an arborist, but that's that's not a good thing. (laughs) The tree's not growing properly. We know something's wrong with it because it's the very nature of living things to grow. It's the nature of trees to grow. It's the nature of human beings to grow. And any living thing that's not growing is probably dying. That's true for the gospel, and it's true for churches. So Paul says, in the same way, I put it in red again, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. It's the nature of the true gospel to grow. Every now and then, over the years, someone has asked me, Pastor Brian, how big do you think the local church should be? How big should a church be? And sometimes it's an it's a honest question about, you know, see churches of 20,000 people or 200 people. What's the ideal size for a church? But sometimes it's because church, the church has grown and created changes and pressures and some degree of discomfort, and, and that's why the question is asked. Maybe we've added the service, maybe added the campus, changed the name, and it creates discomfort. And I always respond to the question something like, well, you know, that's really not my decision. I don't know. Uh, sometimes I say I'm in sales, not management. Uh, but it's not really my decision. The New Testament never puts a lid on the size of a church, a local church. It never does. There are all kinds of different churches mentioned, but it never says, you know, really at this size you ought to cap it. Imagine Jesus saying, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Just make sure it doesn't get too big. Of course he wouldn't say that. It's the nature of the gospel to grow. Paul says it grows, first of all, in people. The gospel is bearing fruit and growing among you, he says. Years ago, I met a a young man right here at South Street Campus. He was engaged to a young gal who was already going to our church here. But when I met him, he was not yet a follower of Christ. He was interested. He was coming to church, probably because she was coming here. But he wasn't yet a believer, was not raised in a Christian home. Didn't know anything from anything about the gospel. But he learned. And uh, the miracle happened in his life. At some point in their engagement, he became a a follower of Jesus. He he put his faith in Christ. Began to grow. And they got married. And about six months after they were married, I went and visited him at his house. We were just having coffee, checking in how's it going. And he had told me earlier that most of his life he had struggled with an explosive temper. 
that he'd been in brawls and fights and even with his brothers and with, with his boss at work. I mean, he just was a, he was a high-strung guy. But so we're sitting over his, his uh, kitchen table, and he said, hey, Pastor Ryan, something, something weird's happening. Maybe you can help me understand it. I said, what's that? He goes, well, you know, remember I told you I have this explosive temper all my life? I said, yeah, yeah, he told me. And he said, you know, it doesn't happen very much anymore. Something will happen, I'll feel it, and I just, it just, I just feel more peaceful, and I, it, I don't blow up. And I said, well, Tom, I don't want to spook you out or anything, but I think what's happening is when you became a follower of Jesus, the Holy Spirit invaded your life and is beginning to do a work in you. And I quoted for him Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. He looked back at me and he went, whoa. That is so cool, he said. See, he didn't even know. But the gospel was bearing fruit already in his life. We say all the time, the gospel transforms people, and transformed people make an impact in the world. Secondly, Paul says the gospel grows not only in people, but through people. Verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Paul's doing a couple things here, and I love what he's doing. He's, he's sort of giving a shout-out to Epaphras, this young pastor of this church in Colossae. I think he's doing that because there may have, some, of these, uh, some of these popular teachers who are rising up, confusing the people, I think maybe they were saying, you know, your, pa- this, this, your young pastor Epaphras, he really hasn't been educated like we have been. He doesn't know the latest theologies and latest mysticism coming down the pike. You need to listen to us, not him. And so Paul's saying, Listen to Epaphras. He learned from me. He's faithful to Christ. Listen to him. Trust him as your leader. I think it's really, really wonderful what Paul does right there. But then he's also telling us how the gospel grows. It grows through people. It leaps from person to person through relationships. If I were able to sit down with each one of you today, one-on-one, and say, hey, tell me about how you came to believe the gospel. Tell me how you came to make Jesus Lord and Savior You'd tell me a story, and eventually, every single one of you, I think, would get to a person. Someone who helped you understand, someone who encouraged you, someone who lived before you what it looked like to follow Jesus, and you wanted that. That's why, by the way, our vision as a church is to become a family of neighborhood churches. That's why why we have seminars on neighboring, loving and serving neighbors, because... The gospel travels across relational bridges. Thirdly, Paul says, the gospel will grow indefinitely. He says, it's bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. He's telling us the gospel is unstoppable. For two reasons. First, Jesus said it's unstoppable. He said, you will be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. Secondly, It's unstoppable because the gospel is grace, and that's the third thing today, and grace itself is unstoppable. Look what Paul says. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it, and I put it in red again, and truly understood God's grace. See what I think Paul is doing here? I think he's trying to remind these believers in Colossae and this young pastor named Epaphras, and maybe some of us here today, that we're not crazy, that you're not crazy. He knows they're being bombarded with all these confusing messages. They're immersed in a culture that's telling them that they have to be crazy to believe the gospel. They're immersed in a culture that's telling telling them it's foolish to believe that that a man, that God became a man, that became, became flesh, and that man died on a cross of all things, and was raised again, and that somehow he can transform your life from the inside out. That's craziness. It's foolishness. I wonder if that sounds familiar. If you're a college or university student today, you're immersed in a culture that's every day telling you that you have to be crazy to believe the gospel. That you're way behind modern times. You're not crazy. We are living in a culture today that is increasingly indifferent to or hostile toward what I'm talking about this morning. That for us to spend an hour here Reading from this ancient book, believing that God somehow speaks through it, is a crazy waste of time. That's the culture we live in today. Paul's reminding us that we're not crazy, and here's how he does it. 
He's reminding them that it all starts with a personal experience of God's grace. He says, remember the day grace became real to you. Remember when the gospel, the truth of the gospel, traveled from your head to your heart and exploded into new life. Remember that, because that's real. I think Paul's remembering here. I can't prove it, but if I could have a conversation with him, I'd ask him. I think he's remembering personally that day long before when he was traveling on the road to Damascus on his way to persecute and imprison and maybe kill the crazy Christians because he saw them as a threat. And on the way, Jesus confronted him in a light from heaven that knocked him onto the road, made him blind, but communicated to him that he was chosen by God to be an apostle of this grace. And Paul spent the rest of his life trying to explain the height and depth and width and breadth of the love of Christ that transformed him from the inside out. He says, remember the day you understood God's grace. Paul is saying that to understand the true gospel, we have to truly understand God's grace. Now every now and then I see a story in the newspaper or um, on the CBS Twitter feed, which I look at pretty much every day. I see a story that grabs my attention. I saw one a few weeks ago, and I'll share it with you now. It's a story of a man named David Eubank and his family. David Eubank served in the U.S. military for about a decade, including a lot of time in the Middle East with Army Special Forces. And then when he got, and that would be enough for me just to consider him a hero, just doing that. But after that, he served for the last 20 years with a Christian relief organization. I think he may have founded, I'm not sure on that, but a Christian relief organization in Asia and the Middle East just simply dedicated to helping suffering people in that part of the world. And a couple of years ago, he chose to move his whole family, wife and three young children under the age of 14, to Iraq, to the city of Mosul. Now, if you know anything about the Middle East, Mosul is one of the most violent, dangerous places on the face of the earth. It's the center of ISIS, okay? Thousands of people are fleeing from that area every day. David Eubank and his family moved into Mosul to minister to suffering people in that city. It's a remarkable story. Then, about three weeks ago, early June, he was on a routine patrol in the area and came across a, just a terrible scene. 50 people gunned down by ISIS terrorists in cold blood. Just bodies piled up. And so he was photographing that just to document the slaughter. And he noticed movement. And he realized there were survivors. More than that, he noticed there was one little girl, turned out to be a nine-year-old little girl, who was hiding under the robes of her mother who had been murdered. And he decided he was going to rescue her. So he called the local military, asked for a smoke covering, and he ran 150 yards through withering gunfire, because the ISIS soldiers were still there, ran through withering gunfire, grabbed this little girl, ran 150 yards back through the gunfire, and saved her life. As I was reading, and you can look it up, David Eubank, there's video taken of this whole thing. It's a real story. And he's the follower of Jesus. But I was reading the story, and I just felt overwhelmed by emotion, kind of like during that generosity video. And I was wondering to myself, what kind of person does that? Who runs, who does that? Who goes into Mosul instead of running away from it? Who goes where they don't have to go? And I realized I was looking at a picture of grace. I was looking at a parable of the gospel. David Eubank didn't have to go there. He chose to go there. That little girl was, had no hope of, of surviving herself. She was as good as dead. Could not save herself. But at great risk to himself, he ran through and he saved her and gave her the gift of new life. See, the gospel tells us the world is broken. The world cannot save itself. Humankind cannot, we cannot save ourselves. Technology will not save us. Evolution will not save us. The world's broken. But God, but God has already rescued us in Christ. That's the gospel. That's the announcement of the good news. And until we understand that we are each that little girl, we don't understand the gospel. Until we un understand the uncomfortable truth that we have no hope without Christ rescuing us, we don't understand grace. And until we understand the uncomfortable truth that we are now, as recipients of grace, called to move into that world as ambassadors of that grace, we don't understand the gospel. But when we do, when the grace of Christ invades our hearts, Paul says, it explodes into growth. It produces faith and hope and love that is unstoppable. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord, I thank you for your word for this ancient letter.
the truth of the gospel and the power of your grace. Keep us from being confused by all the confusing voices and counterfeit gospels. Lord, I pray particularly for our younger people in school or in universities, coming of age in a culture that tells them increasingly that they're crazy to believe this stuff. Remind them that they're not crazy. Anchor our faith deep in the endless riches of your grace. Teach us to be ambassadors of your grace in this world.